Another question, Larry? Uh, this question assumes that there is a need to slow population. Uh, in the industrial West, they say there are less children because women get education, thus they have children later, fewer, and have jobs. Um, in developing countries where either tradition or the economy does not allow women to get, let's say, jobs or higher education, and thus lower birth rate, how does education stop birth growth in developing countries? Okay, I would suggest that David Rothbard probably is uh, the person most ready to answer that, or Alan Carlson. Who wants to take it? All right, Dr. I'm sorry, <laughs> Dr. Ahmad of the Minaret of Freedom Institute. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rahim, in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Uh, the effect that <clears throat> education has is in uh, multiple methods. I think the answer lies in the last speech you heard about the distinction between population control and family planning. Family planning will not necessarily result in populations going down. They may go down or they may go up. In the agricultural community, having a large family is a good thing economically speaking and by just about every parameter. That's why the example the ambassador gave of India going from a population of 250 uh, million to 800 million and then going from a net consumer or importer of agricultural products to a net exporter. The decision of whether things should go down or up are decisions that should be made by individual families, by the couples. If the couples are educated, number one, they will make informed decisions. They will make logical decisions. And number two, the family that has educated parents, especially educated mothers, this is why in our statement we said that education of women is valuable even if the woman does not go into the commercial workplace. A woman who can teach her children is going to produce productive children. If the productivity of a country goes up, it can be self-supporting. If a family is productive, it can be self-supporting. If the children are productive, they can take care of not only themselves and their children, but their aging parents. All these things come out of education. And that is why education is the real solution to the population issue. It's interesting that uh, we would be criticized for trying to get a, a favorable voice in the West when for so long we've been uh, accused of doing just the opposite. So it's like, uh, which would you like us to do? Would you like us to be against you or with you? So uh, we, we prefer to work with those who share our beliefs, share our goals, share our agenda. It doesn't matter who they are. All right, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, on the issue of the... Uh of what you say is the West trying to impose its programs and values on the rest of the world. Uh, according to United Nations figures, more than 100 countries have uh, family planning programs as government-sponsored family planning programs. I think the figure for abortion is more than 150 countries permitted in one form or another, some limited, some wider. Uh, are you trying to uh, change that, tell governments that they should not permit this and therefore impose your values upon what countries are trying to do. Looks like we have a lot of takers on this question. We'll take Mr. Hooper first. Well, you have to remember that particularly in the Islamic world, the governments rarely represent the people. Usually there's some form of Western ideology. That's what they follow, either uh, from the former Soviet Union, from the West, some form of socialism, uh, capitalism, whatever. It's a foreign ideology of a westernized elite that doesn't, that pays more attention to the wishes of the West than it does to the wishes of its own people. These are unelected regimes, unrepresentative regimes, and by no means do they try and implement Islamic law. They try and implement whatever will keep them in power. And sometimes they even have a uh, minority of, of so-called Muslim scholars who will, who will parrot their own beliefs to the people to try and convince them to follow what the government says. I lived for a year in Egypt. Uh, abortion is quite easy to obtain in Egypt. All you need is the 150 Egyptian pounds, about uh, $40, to go to a, a doctor and you get an abortion. That isn't what Islamic law says. Islamic law says abortions are only permitted to save the life of the mother. So obviously the government is not promoting Islamic law, they're promoting their own agenda, which obviously is being forced upon them by the West. 
the question, <clears throat> the question was whether uh, we're trying to impose our views on abortion on uh, the rest of the world. And I want to say no to that question three times. First, no because it's based on a misunderstanding of the Islamic position on abortion. No because it seems to be based on a misunderstanding of what we're trying to achieve inside this room. And no because it's based on a misunderstanding of what we're trying to achieve, the Muslims are trying to achieve outside of this room. First on the issue of abortion, <clears throat> the Muslim view on abortion, the traditional historic view, was that the fetus became a person at the time of insolment, which most of the scholars put at the fourth month. The dates may have changed, but no scholar believed that it was from the time of conception. More modern theorists have tried to push the time of, uh, that abortion would become forbidden as opposed to merely disliked back to conception. Uh, they're entitled to their opinion. But it is certainly not something that is uh, explicit in the Quran and could not even be imposed on Muslims, let alone on the rest of the world. I also say no because what we're trying to do in this room is not to provide an alternative to the Cairo Agreement which we want to impose on the world through the manipulative mechanisms that the UN has its, at its disposal, which one of the speakers talked about through the uh, offering and withholding of funds that are taken from the donor countries. <clears throat> we are criticizing the document itself. And we are not saying that we want to replace it with anything in particular of our own. But third, even in general, as far as the Muslim uh, Dawah mission, our, uh, our, our attempt to invite people to Islam, uh, the view of the Muslims obviously is that we think we have the ideal way of life. And we do invite everyone to embrace that way of life. But if people don't want to embrace it, then we ask as regards these issues, that they should consider embracing their own religious traditions. Christianity and Judaism, as has been pointed out here before, have moral values in common with Islam. And people should embrace a moral tradition. If you're not willing to embrace your tradition, moral traditions, then at least we invite you to consider that ethics and values are important and to submit yourself to some ethical system that will prevent the problems that we see in the world today with the rampant uh, forms of, uh, of aggression and oppression, of which we think this uh, Cairo Agreement will only contribute. Uh, I'll be very brief. The few policy recommendations in the Cairo Agreement <clears throat> that I would agree with are so general in nature that they're of no use in this context. And to push them in this context is to lead to negative consequences. For example, in the matter of education of women, we made it clear in our statement we favor education of women, especially universal literacy. But the contents of the education, the format of the education, the duration of the education that might be brought about through its implementation through this document is not necessarily something that we would be in favor of. You as far as you are against forcing abortion on women, which I respect, what about forcing women in some Islamic uh, countries not to go to work, not to have just their drive license? Mr. Hooper. Does Islamic law force a woman uh, to stay in a home? Does the Islamic law prohibit a woman from having a license? You have to ask these countries, not me. What's this that? Is, you have to ask these Islamic governments, not me. Which Islamic government? Egypt? I think you are aware about some Islamic countries where women are not allowed to go to work, not allowed to wear. Is if any or have right to drive is license. taken away from a woman in the Muslim world, it's in spite of Islam, not because of it. As I'm sure you know, Islam granted women rights 1,400 years ago that only recently were given to women in the West. Indeed. So Islam is the original feminist ideology. So if a society oppresses women, it's, it's not an Islamic society. But it's, it's the main Islamic society is actually over there. There are societies where the majority of the people are Muslim. There are very few societies, if any, where the government is Islamic. We are aware about the problem happening to many women in Saudi Arabia regarding the drive license. And Even the Saudis don't justify the ban on women driving using Islamic law. They justify using Saudi traditions. I about think that's going to have to, that, that conversation will have to be reserved for, uh, for a little bit afterwards. I want to thank you all for coming. I hope you uh, found it a productive news conference. And our panelists will be available, most of them, uh, for private conversation afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much.